all the time. This is my favorite thing to say about God because if it wasn't for His goodness, brethren, none of us would be here. Amen. Amen. At this time, I would like to give recognition, first of all, to Reverend Larson and family. Good man. I made a mistake by calling you Reverend Clark the last time, so we ain't gonna do that again. Because <laughs> Reverend Clark is my is my minister, so it's a it's a familiarity. I give recognition to all the elders who are here, to the liturgists who did a fantastic job. Yes. To the ushers, to the musicians, well, musician, the musician that was doing a fantastic job. Let's go with them. The musicians, amen. And all the faithful members who continue to come to church, even though you could be doing anything else. God bless you all. Give yourself a hand. At this point, I would like to extend thanks to my mentor for allowing me the opportunity to preach God's Word to all of you Amen. and to be a part of God's work in the edification of this church and His people. Reverend Larson is the best preacher I know. I don't know if you know someone better, but he's the best one I know. His ability to speak, his ability to flow in his speech, his brilliant mind, his capacity to write multiple volumes of literature. And not only that, he's a faithful man of God, a faithful family man and minister. Those roles and more will always be huge shoes to fill in my life whenever I'm active in those same roles. Amen. If it wasn't for God using him and Reverend Clark, I would not have all the opportunities that I have to preach God's word to God's people. Amen. So with that said, I would like to give my dear brother in Christ Thanks, and for all of you by extension, for allowing me to preach God's word. Amen. Thank you all so much. God bless you. Amen. I am happy to be here, and I hope the feeling is mutual. Oh, yes. Amen. Oh, yes. Let us all at this time turn our Bibles to the book of 1 Peter. We're looking at chapter 1, verse 17. To verse 13. The word of God declares. If you address as father. The one who impartially judges. According to each one's work. Conduct yourselves in fear. During the time of your stay on earth. Knowing that you were not redeemed. With perishable things like silver or gold. From your futile way of life. Inherited from your forefathers but with precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Yes. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised them from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. Brethren, I would like to speak to all of you today using the sermonic title, The Imperishable Harvest. Yes. The Imperishable Harvest. I'd like to give you the background of this letter. In this culture, back in 64 AD, Christianity was misunderstood and membership to this group, despite its growing population, could bring enormous risks. Widely criticized after the great fire in Rome in that same year, the Emperor Nero diverted attention from himself 
from his failings or his intentional starting of the fire to the obvious scapegoat, the Christians. People who are not afraid to preach a coming fiery judgment. Nero thought to himself, in order for me to convince the people of this culture that I did not start that fire, which more likely he did, I'm going to blame on the Christians, the people who love to preach about a fiery judgment that is on the way for those who live in sin. Although the followers of Jesus were working hard to spread the message, there were still very few Christians in Rome. They were regarded with suspicion. Some important Christian rituals, such as communion or the Lord's Supper, were mistaken for cannibalism. Because we'd always say we're drinking the blood of our Savior and eating the bread, eating the flesh. Others, as insists, because Christians call each other brother and sister, yes. whenever we gather together, they misunderstood that to be sexual origins. From that culture's perspective, Christians were also seen as atheists. Because Christians worship an invisible God. Not a God who was made by hands and placed in a shrine or placed in a house yes. that you bow down to and in turn have to clean and wipe because that God can't do it himself. Christians became a very easy target. Nero wasted no time, brethren. He arrested and tortured all the Christians in Rome that he could find before executing with lavish and public torture. Some Christians were crucified some were thrown to wild animals to be eaten after being wrapped up in animal skin and flesh. Some were dressed in clothing that was soaked in wax, placed on poles, and then lit on fire. Others were burned alive. Others were nailed to poles, and others were crucified. The persecution, brethren, reached to the regions that are mentioned in chapter 1, verse 1 of this book. Yes. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That is why serving God and living holy despite suffering is a very, very obvious theme throughout this book. Yes. When you look at chapter 2, verse 19 through 21, Peter admonishes the believers by saying this, for this finds favor, if for the sake of consciousness toward God, a person bears under suffering and sorrow. We also see this in chapter 3, verse 9. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. And finally we hear, who is there to harm you if you prove? Zealous for what is good. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear their intimidation, brethren. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, always being ready to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which they slander you, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. We see this over and over again throughout this book. Bear under persecution. Stand under persecution. Knowing that you are a child of God. Knowing that you are blessed. And the temporary struggles that you are going through now will not even be worthy of comparison to what you will have in the end. These Christians, brethren, were going through tremendous persecution. They were accused of many sins. They were accused of many wrongdoing. But Peter says, live holy in this world despite what you go through. Yes. You see this obvious theme. Now when you look at this text that we read earlier, and you go through the book, 
And you have established that Peter is talking to individuals who are suffering and struggling. It motivates you and I to look at our lives and see if we are struggling in the same way that they were struggling. In my short time living, in my short time of life, I've never heard of a Christian being burned alive in Jamaica. Mercy. I've never heard of a Christian being wrapped up in wax and animal flesh being eaten and burned alive. I've never heard of Christians being accused of orgies and accused of cannibalism. But these Christians were in this culture. Yes. That is why this brings me to our theme, the imperishable harvest. Because in the last verse that we read, verse 23, it says that you were born again by seed which is imperishable. What does this word mean, brethren? This word simply means indestructible, yes. incorruptible, and immortal. This word simply means that no matter what you go through in your life, the outside obstacles and the outside tribulation cannot corrupt the seed that is inside. Oh, yes. The outside struggle and the outside worries of life cannot corrupt that seed that God has placed in you. That is why when you look at this word throughout Scripture, it is descriptive of God in Romans chapter 1 where the Bible says that we have exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man. We see this mentioned again where the Bible says that we are living a life of holiness for a reed, a reward that is not perishable but is imperishable. We hear of the twinkling of an eye when all of us will be transformed from being perishable into the imperishable. Yes. We also hear it described of Christ when it says that he is the king eternal, immortal, imperishable. Yes. And we also read about the behavior that is pleasing to God, a behavior that is gentle, which is an imperishable spirit. Yes. This imperishable seed, brethren, is what is in every believer and will ultimately lead to the harvest. Yes. This brings me to three reasons why this harvest is imperishable. Reason number one is we have been redeemed by Christ. In verse 18 through 19, the Bible says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold through your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Brethren, we are redeemed by the life of Christ. This is why the scripture says in Leviticus chapter 17, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. This, brethren, simply shows every single individual that when the Bible mentions Christ shedding his blood for his people, it is making reference to him giving his life for his people. When the Bible says that his blood is without spot, without blemish, and without defect, it is talking about his life being without spot, without blemish, and without defect.
and he lays down his life for his people. Yes. But notice what verse 18 said. You were not redeemed from your futile way of life with perishable things, but the imperishable blood, imperishable life of Christ. What is this futile life, brethren? That is the life that you and I used to live. A life without purpose. A life without meaning. A life without Christ. A life without our God. But when God came and he sent forth his son to die for all those who would believe, wretched sinners like you and I can have a life of holiness. That is why we have an imperishable harvest. I know that some of us don't want to think about the life that we used to live. Some of us don't want to think about the times when we used to teeth. Some of us don't want to think about the times when we used to cuss and die in people's back. Some of us don't want to think about the times when we used to go to the club and dress in all manner of ways. But let me remind you, there was a time when you were unholy, but God came and saved you. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There was a time, brethren, when we were all living in darkness, dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses, but God, being rich in mercy, rich in grace, came and set us free from the slavery of death and sin. Hallelujah. We have been redeemed. And we have an imperishable harvest. Reason number two. We believe in God by the grace of God. Look at verse 21 and verse 20. Verse 20 to verse 21. It says, For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God. This text rightly says, brethren, that it is through him, through Christ, that you are believers in God. One of the aspects, brethren, of the fruit of the Spirit is faith. If you have the Spirit of God coming inside of you, you will have faith. And the Bible says in John chapter 6 that this is the work of God, that you believe. The Bible also says in Philippians chapter 1 that you have been granted not only to suffer for His sake, but also to believe. Brethren, all the matter of struggles that these Christians went through, all the matter of struggles that we go through, we still believe because we have a faith that comes from an eternal God. A faith that comes from a God who never fails and never struggles. A faith that will never disappear. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. We believe by the grace of God. Amen. That is why when you have two individuals who are raised in a Christian home. Two individuals who hear the gospel every Sunday. Two individuals who live a life around people who are Christians. And only one of them believe. What is the difference? What took place in the other one's life? The only answer is grace. The only answer, brethren, is grace. The can't say, because you ain't smarter than the person. The can't say, because you ain't holy. And when you think about this on the flip side, those who don't grow up in church in long time, those who never go to church, all they do is go to the club, to the bar, and they hear the gospel walking by them one day, and all of a sudden they believe. Why? Because of the grace of God. Yes. Yes. That is why Peter rightly said, you have been born again by seed, which is not perishable, but in passion. God's word that is dwelling in your heart. And there's one more thing that I have to address at this particular point. Because we sometimes think, after living the Christian life for a long time, that we have made it. That we reach. That we have come to that point. 
when nobody can look Paul in our more, nobody can talk about us anymore, nobody can challenge us anymore, but let me tell you, you're not rich yet. God is still working on you. God is still pruning you. God is still increasing that seed in you until that final day of the harvest. That is why we must stay humble. That is why we must live a humble life. That is why we must never look at the sinner and say we're better than them. Because we were just like them are worse. We were just like them and we would have been just like them and still in that condition unless God came and set us free. We live by His grace. His grace alone. And this reminds us as well that when we think about salvation, when we think about the power of God, this reminds us, brethren, that God need your permission to save you. Mercy. God does not need to consult you to save you. Mercy. God does not need to knock on the door of your heart. What I did in the Bible. God does not have to knock and try to come in because our God cannot be stopped. Our God cannot be overcome. Our God cannot fail when he wants to save. He saves. Oh, yes. Amen. Oh, yes. He came for the sake of us. He came for the sake of his people. He came for the sake of all those who would believe. He is a chief. Eternal life, brethren, is everlasting. It doesn't go away. That's why it puzzles me when my fellow believers in Christ say that they lose their salvation and then they get it again. They, they, they lose their eternal life and then they find it again. Mercy. They lose their faith and then they find it again. Let me, let me tell you something. If something is eternal, it can't lose. Yes. If something is eternal, it is long lasting. Yes. If something is eternal, there is no decay and there is no end. Once God saves you, yes. he keeps you saved. And kept by the grace yes. of God. Yes. I don't like to go all over the place. So in this same chapter, verse 5, the Bible says that those who have been born again are protected by the power of God for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Brother, I know I am protected. I know I am secure. I know that there is nothing that can happen in my life that can cause to lose my faith not because of me but because of the God who holds on to me the God who never fails the God who never makes a mistake the God who will carry out his work to perfection does never fail hallelujah that's why Paul agrees with Peter in Philippians chapter 1 he says who began a good work in you will finish it. Brethren, God, I don't know what you want me. When we start something, we're going to finish it. When we make promise that we're going to finish something, I don't know that I'll know. When we make promise that we're going to show up at a certain time, I don't know how I'll know. When God said He's going to do something, He'll do it. No questions asked. Our God is the ultimate promise keeper. Our God is the ultimate provider. If God says you will be our right, you will be our right. We serve a God who never fails. When he says something go happen, it happen. If God said a year time, a year time. If God said a year time yet, a year time yet. When God opens a door, no one can shut. When God shuts a door, no one The door is always open for me. God not lock the door upon me. God not lock the door upon you people. That is why the prodigal son, before he stopped.
I'll come back here, Father, I already have me hand up. Before he come back, Father, I already have weird for him. God have this door open all the time, waiting for his people to come back. He now locked the door upon me. Because God said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. I will be there for you in the storm, in the valleys, and in all trouble. God never fears. We believe in God by the grace of God. Yes. Not you, not me. We can't even credit it to the pastor. He preach. He can't preach good so more. He can't preach bad so more. And I ain't make you see him. I can't see him. Oh goodness. Some of you some of us forget that, you know. Some of us forget that. Some pastors, brethren, because their church full, they feel that they impress God. Because their church full of people, they feel that they make it and so they go. We are people in their church. You give God glory because all Into the barn of God. 
God. We see it in Revelation 14. It says, And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour has come. Because the harvest of the earth is ripe. And you know what happens? The angel is going to come. And the wheat and the tares that grew together are going to be separated because the parable says you can't separate them, no. Because if you try to separate them, you might root up the good ones and the bad ones. So you got to wait on the king who knows the hearts of all men. He know every single one of we who will play church. He know every single one of we who are hypocrites. He know every single one of we who unite to the money and the fame and the accolades. You know every single one of we who they act like so we see him and they act like so we are Christian. He you know they all are we and in that day, in that final day, we somehow will get the surprise of our life because he's going to separate the true ones from the fake ones. He's going to separate the wheat from the tears. The final day of harvest. God will come and take his people home. And no silly no side. Some people who play a church. They dress the nicest. They look the best. They might look this when prison worship at one. The look on their life is shut. Oh God, some of you, if we're too old, we sit there with you. Because we said, well, I see you see a church last week. Oh goodness, mercy. I hear you see a church last week. I can't, I must be twin brother. I go to conference, see a him, you lose yourself, my goodness. There are hypocrites in the church, brethren. Me not afraid to talk. There are hypocrites in the church. They act like they sin. And they're not dirty rich. If you spend time with them, bad company, corrupt, good morals. That's why Paul said, remove them from among you. Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump of soul. We are mess with hypocrites. We are mess with false people. We are mess with dead Christians. We are live holy. We are live righteous. And we walk with the good. We talk with the good.